Well, good evening and welcome to Tea Time. That's right, we're back here for the final show of tonight and this week. And tonight we have an incredible inventor of the Septimatics, and he'll be sharing with us on how he created this and about his book and all of that good stuff. But before we get started on all that good stuff, we do do all of the good stuff that Miss Liz does for each of her tea times. The disclaimer and then the quick little intro of the bio, and then we get the guest in here and we share a good TEA. And each TEA is different. So let's be open-minded for tonight's conversation. So the disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time Live show. Miss Liz is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussion for some where they may, may be emotionally at risk. It is significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, me Miss Liz, at my email at bookymissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in tonight's show in any aspect, I, Miss Liz, welcome you. And if you should choose that tonight's show is not made for you, I will respect that and see you at a later show at a later date. And again, all tea times this year are done on Thursday unless it's a rescheduled tea time. So now let's get a little into who Jim Marshall is. So Mr. Jim Marshall is a polymatic intellect who has, has devoted over 50,000 hours to the study and practice of multiple dimensions of human potential and development. He received a classical education as an honor student at Jesuit Military Prep School, was accepted into engineering school while still a junior in prep school, and attended college at academic scholarship. He graduated college with a bachelor's of science cum laude. While still at an undergraduate, he began the studies of an altered art, arts and science, which today would be described as transformational and holistic. Eventually, he became a professional pr practitioner and after 28 years of formal education, had a long career as a human developed engineer. Jim has integrated the best aspects of the most advanced techniques of the planet and expanded their limits by his own research and discovery. He has successfully treated and or trained hundreds of clients over a 40 year career and is the inventor of Septimatics and several, sub, several consciousness expanding systems. His areas of expertise include philosophy, uh, philosophy, 
tel teleology, science, engineering, mathematics, laws, literature, history, music, organization, and many, many more. So let's get Jim in here and let's find out what septematics is all about. So welcome, Jim. It's an honor to have you here tonight. Hi, Liz. So could you get into what septematics is and how you got all started on this, Jim? Okay, well, first of all, it's called Septemex. Septemex. S-E-P-T-E-M-I-C-S. -E um, well, Septemex is a philosophical science based on the fact that many phenomena related to human beings occur in a sequence of seven levels. Literally, the word Septemex means over pertaining to seven. Septemex comprises a collection of scales or sequences each of which breaks down various human phenomena into a hierarchy of seven steps. There are 35 such scales which span the spectrum of human experience, by which I mean any situation or difficulty or dilemma which arises in the life of any person can successfully be analyzed by one or more of these scales. 24 of the scales apply primarily to individuals and 11 apply primarily to groups. That's as far as what Septemex is. Now, you also asked me how I got into this? Yes. Okay. So this is a longer answer. So the story really starts when I was, at age 16, accepted into an elite engineering school, which I attended on academic scholarship. Now, I thought at the time that I was going to be engineering physical things, like every other engineer, such as electrons or airfoils or motors. But by the time I had my bachelor's degree, I realized that I wanted to engineer the human psyche, which is not physical at all. Uh, and to make a long story short, I had a long career as a human development engineer, as you mentioned, helping hundreds of people. And while I was doing so, I started to notice incidentally that my clients were improving in ways that were predictable to me. Now, I never told this to anyone, but I made notes. And as the decades rolled by, I started accruing all of this data, which made it clear that my clients were at some level on any one of several different axes and as a result of the session, we would move up to the next level, which I also knew. So, of course, this only made me better at what I did. Now, again, I didn't tell this to anybody, least of all my clients, but I made notes. And by about 1995, I had about 32 scales of varying lengths between three and seven. Now, there was one scale in particular that I had that by then I knew axiomatically was correct. It was uh, actual, in other words, it was always reliable. And I realized in 95 that it had a seventh level, which was a big turning point for me. When I inserted that seventh level into the sixth level scale, it manifested mathematically. And being a mathematician, I, I knew that that meant that I had discovered natural law. Whatever this thing was, was natural law. Because anything that has mathematics embedded in it is natural law. <clears throat> so I then asked myself, I wonder how many of these other scales uh, are actually seven level scales that had not been developed all the way because I wasn't developing anything. I was just treating my clients and making notes. So knowing what I was looking for, I inspected these other 32 scales or whatever the number was that I had at the moment. And <clears throat> because I knew what I was looking for, they all went to seven pretty easily. And I realized in a, in a period of months that I had about 32 seven level scales. Now, <clears throat> I said, as each one went to seven, it manifested mathematically, which again told me this is natural law, in the same sense that the Fibonacci sequence is natural law. So uh, I said, wait a minute, I can go from helping people by the hundreds, 
which is what I have been doing as human development engineer, to helping them by the millions by putting this in a book and getting it out. So the first draft was completed in December of 95, and I sent it to colleagues of mine, all of whom had graduate degrees in a variety of subjects. And although they all had different responses, they all loved it. So that told me, okay, this is exactly what I think it is. It's a new subject. So then I embarked on a 25 year journey of perfecting this subject. So I realized I had to first discover the phenomena, which was largely done by 95, although I did find three more scales as I was writing the book. Then I had to use this data to craft a workable philosophic system. That took 20 years. But the most time consuming aspect of this was expressing it in a way that would make sense to the average reader. Uh, so there were many rewrites and I kept uh, rearranging the book. And for example, I added glossaries, not only one for every chapter, but there's even one for the introduction. So that really helps as far as getting the people to understand what I'm talking about. So after 25 years, I said, well, I'm not going to live forever. I better get this book out. And I published it. <clears throat> that was two years ago. And since then, I've been promoting the book. And I should mention that anybody who's ever read this book has had a positive reaction. I've never had anybody say anything like, I don't get this, or this doesn't make any sense, or anything like that. Usually the reaction I get is something like, wow, or this blew me away. Now, I'm telling you what they say. I, I don't speak that way, but that is what they tell me. So uh, when I get a chance to explain this to people, they get it. And when they actually see the scales themselves, then they really get it. Because this is designed to wrap around the reader. In other words, each one of these scales is expressed in what you might call a table or a spreadsheet. And when you look at that table or spreadsheet, it makes sense to almost everyone right away. So realize you're looking at natural law. So because it's natural law, it connects with people. People look at it and it's like the Fibonacci sequence. You don't need to be convinced of the Fibonacci sequence. Once you, once you know the formula and you see the living creatures that are constructed by it, it's inarguable. And that's sort of how these scales are. They're, they're natural. Uh, there's, I did not inject any of my opinion or belief into the scales themselves. This is just what I discovered empirically. There's no theory of septemics. I just found it and I'm sharing it with people. So why is the septemics significant? Well, first of all, let me say this. I wrote the book to help people. Each of these 35 scales provides the user with an infallible way of determining the salutariness or beneficialness of any group, individual, or activity. If the group individual activity moves persons or groups up these scales, it's beneficial or positive. And if it moves them down, it's detrimental or negative. More importantly, just finding out what level you or another is at on any scale, what level you're at, is enlightening and beneficial. And finally, once you know the actual level of a person or group, you can improve that person or group by moving them up one level at a time. All of these advantages represent major steps forward for society. Each of these scales is an axis against which to evaluate or measure human behavior and combine the empower one to understand, predict, and manage uh, human affairs to a degree hitherto unattainable by most. Now, the data in this book are vital for every human being and can help you to achieve your goals faster and easier by explaining what might otherwise seem to be inexplicable or random. If someone were to invite you to a rendezvous, you would certainly expect him to tell you the time, the date, the location, and perhaps also how to get there. Now, needless to say, it's very difficult to get anywhere if you don't know where you are, where you're going, and how to get to your destination. Now, this sounds idiotic, 
but most people do this regularly. In fact, many people do this continuously. And this book absolutely solves that problem because it tells you across 35 axes, when you find your level, where you are, it tells you the next level up, which is what you should shoot for. Because you see, if you're at, let's say level five, you will be able to get to level four. If you try to get to level one, two or three, you will fail because it's too steep a gradient. So I have solved the gradient problem that has bedeviled humans for 6,000 years. Most people can look at a, a situation or a dilemma or a problem and see that it's there, but they don't really know how to solve it because they don't know the gradient. So the levels themselves are the gradient. In other words, it goes in a certain order, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you find your level or another person's level, and then you move up. So it's kind of a foolproof system for self-improvement. So you're kind of talking about the, the granites. So you're talking about the, the granites. You're talking about the flows and the patterns, correct? Well, the gradients are embedded in the levels themselves. You see, one of the axioms of this subject is that you can never skip a level. Okay. Think of it this way. If you're, on, if you're on the first floor and you want to go to the fifth floor, you have to go through the second, the third, and the fourth one way or another. Whether you take the elevator, the escalator, the stairs, or go outside the building and take a rope ladder. And that's how this works. Now, this is actually good news because I am giving you the formula for success across 35 axes. The other thing you have to realize is that some of these scales are general and some of them are specific. Now, on the specific scales, you can use the scale in a certain context. So for example, the scale of motivation, you can ask yourself, what is my motivation toward my wife? What is my motivation toward my son? What is my motivation toward my mother? And you can ask yourself, what is my boss's motivation toward me? What is my next door neighbor's motivation toward me? And so forth. So you could use that one scale in maybe a hundred different applications. So you could just use that one scale alone to dramatically improve your understanding of your life. And every time you find a level, either of yourself or another person, your mind clarifies because you throw out the other six levels. You know exactly what level you're at. And then you're also benefited by knowing what the next level up is and that becomes your target. So uh, instead of wondering, well, what do I do now? The book tells you what you do now. You're at this level. And therefore, you will be able to get up to the next level. And so you could help people to improve their lives. And you yourself can improve your life by using just this book alone. You don't really need anything else. I, I wrote it in such a way that once you have the book, that's all you need. You, you don't need to take a course. You don't need to spend any money. You don't need to hire a facilitator or anything. It's all in the book. So uh, that's why it took 25 years to craft it in a way that the average reader will be able to use this. And I've spent the last 27 years watching people actually use this, all kinds of people. So we have and a question. Uh, we have a question coming in for you, Jim. Uh, they want to know where you find the scales and the levels. Are they? Are there certain categories? Uh, they're, they're trying to understand the scales and levels here. Okay, well, as I said, the way this, I discovered this. I was, I was like a guy who's walking down a lonely street and found a $100 bill blowing in the wind, picked it up and put it in his pocket. This data simply presented itself to me in the sessions. And I saw these scales work thousands and thousands of times with my clients because the client didn't know anything about the scale. But he would come in and I would see on a certain axis, he was at a certain level. And then as a result of the session, he'd go up to the next level. And I knew that next level. So uh, this is really an engineer's analysis of human phenomena. So I don't know if I answered your question, but that's where they're naturally occurring. These scales 
uh, just exist the way the Pythagorean theorem exists, uh, the way the, uh, the three laws of motion exist. Uh, you know, people sometimes ask, well, what book is your book like? And I have to tell them in all candor, and I don't think there's ever been a book like this before, but each of the 35 scales is very much like the periodic table of elements. Now, before Mendeleev invented the periodic table, there was chemistry, but he revolutionized it by making it easier to understand, easier to learn, easier to teach. And that is sort of what this book is like. It takes the data of life and puts it in a format where the average person who can read English can use it to his benefit. So as to where the scales come from, some people would say they come from God, you know, it's like, well, where does the Pythagorean theorem come from? The Pythagorean theorem is embedded in the universe. It existed before Earth existed, and it will still exist when Earth no longer exists, okay? So that's natural law. So people who don't know too much about natural law will sort of wonder about this, but uh, I think the Fibonacci sequence is, is a really good way to think about this because it's a simple formula. Once you know the formula, you can predict all of the numbers to infinity, and you can go around finding seashells and flowers and pine cones that have these numbers embedded in them. So these creatures have been creating themselves, their, their bodies, so to speak, according to this numerical formula, which they know nothing about. Uh, you see, every person is at some level on every scale. Now, of course, you could ignore that data, but it's much better for you to use it, to use that data for your advantage. So each one of these scales is like a roadmap for the corresponding area of life. Now, if you like, I can read to you the names of the 35 chapters, and then you would know what the corresponding areas are, each of which has seven levels. Would you like that? Yeah, I think that's what the, per the, the, the person is asking here. They're, they want to know the names of the scales. Because okay, fine. So these are the individual scales, meaning they apply more to individuals than to groups. The scale of basic purposes, the scale of personal influence, the scale of choice, the scale of permeation, the scale of thought, the scale of identity, the scale of evaluation, the scale of motivation, the scale of control, the scale of stopping, the scale of scholarship, the scale of literacy, the scale of human ability, the scale of memory, the scale of spiritual identity, the scale of mental deletion, the scale of aberration, the scale of physical fitness, the scale of justification, the scale of belief, the scale of equanimity, the scale of attack, the scale of conflict, and the scale of reaction. And the group scales are the scale of relationships, the scale of life spheres, the scale of government, the scale of civilization, the scale of survival, the scale of management, the scale of exchange, the scale of communication, the scale of allegiance, the scale of sexuality, and the scale of politics. And I have two comments about this. One, each scale is unique. You cannot infer anything about scale A by studying scale B. And the other thing is that every one of these scales has the potential to dramatically improve the life of the reader. Different people will uh, connect with different scales in different ways because every person is unique. Are you still hearing me? Yep, I can hear you. And and I and they're understanding a little bit more now since you mentioned the scales as well, Jim. Uh, I think when we just keep hearing the word scale, we're not understanding what scales are. So okay. For for you to, to tell us what the scales are now, I think they're starting to understand a little bit more of what right. what we're talking about tonight. Right. And, so, it, and we talked about this in the back uh, about how perspectives and how people think in different ways, right? Do uh -huh. we, uh, depending on their lifestyle, depending on their environment, uh, you know, their education, because each person is unique, like you just said. You know, each person has their own way of learning. So who would, who would be the best reader for your book? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Who, who would be the best the reader like, the, for your book? Like it, to read your book, who, what, are, what audience would benefit from it the most? Okay. 
Okay. Well, there's a couple of different answers to that question. The best answer is that anyone who can read English reasonably well and wants to improve himself or his life should get this book because that's what it does. That's what it's for. And it's universally applicable. Uh, in other words, this cuts it off across all demographics. It does not matter gender, age, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic level, education. As long as you can read English and you follow the instructions of the book, it tells you how to study the book and how to use the book, you will get it. You'll get it. it this is not obscure uh, material. In other words, people get this right away. And yeah. I can tell you an anecdote to explain that. About 20 years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine. Uh, he didn't know anything about septemics or the book. And uh, we were talking about politics and government. I said, wait a minute, let me show you something. So I opened up the transcript. The book was in a transcript form at that time. And I handed him the scale of government. I showed him that page. So he took it. I didn't say anything to him. He took it, and in a, uh, one or two seconds, he pointed. And he said, right there, that's where I am. He found his level on that scale without my even suggesting that that's what the scale was for. He didn't know that. That's how easy this is to use. And I'll give you another example of something that happens frequently. A guy looks at a certain scale, right? He doesn't know the material. And like he's going down and he gets to, let's say, level four. And he says, wait a minute. This is my father-in-law. This is exactly how he is. See, he wasn't thinking about his father-in-law. But the manifestation there describes him perfectly because it's natural phenomena. Mm -hmm. So basically, basically, what I tell all of my students and readers and such is, this is a textbook on a new subject. Study it the way you would study a textbook if you were taking a course on a new subject. You start with line one and you go through line by line, making sure you understand everything before you go on. And when you get to the end of the book, go back to the beginning, read it again, and then find your level on every scale. And by the time you finish that, you will be a new person because it clarifies your mind. For example, the first scale in the book is the scale of basic purposes. What could be more important to know than one's basic purpose, either your own or another's? So when you study this, you will be able to find your basic purpose. And that clarifies your whole life because your whole life is in that context. That is how you have been living and will continue to live because most people spend one's entire life at a specific level of that scale. This is a, this is a persistent trait. In other words, people don't move much on this, if at all. Most people don't move on this scale. There are occasional exceptions where a person will go up a level or down a level. But once you find your basic purpose, the light bulb goes on over your head. You throw out the other six levels. You say, that's not for me. That's other people. I'm at this level, and that's what I'm about. And then you can go about your business knowing who you are, what you are, what you're trying to do. Your basic purpose is what you're trying to do. Now, whether or not you succeed is another thing, but that's what you're trying to do. So, for example, I know the basic purpose of every president of the United States going back as far as Franklin Delano Roosevelt and many of the presidents before that who I studied, such as Washington and Lincoln and Jefferson. So I know what those people are about. You see, as I said, this is not obscure. People tell you their levels. If you just listen to someone, he will tell you his level on some scale. For example, I can listen to someone talk for five or 10 minutes and know what level he's at on the, the scale of literacy just by listening to him talk. Now that helps me to understand that's a very specific thing. So for example, I had clients who came to me from Europe. Their first language was not English. So I had to take that into account in dealing with them. So knowing this, being able to spot where they were on the scale facilitated my helping them. 
So if, if, for example, if I were going to have a conversation with Jordan Peterson, he's at a very high level of literacy. That would be very different from the conversation I would have with, let's say, the person who cleans my house, who's at a lower level. Now, this is not about judgment. It's just about knowing what's there. Now, think of it this way. Let's say you say to me, come to my house and look at my garden. I say, okay. So I look at your garden. I see you have roses, you have tulips, you have forget-me-nots, you have chrysanthemums, right? Because I know these categories of flowers, okay? So I can distinguish. That doesn't mean one of them is not as good as another. It's just different flowers. So I describe this as a descriptive science comparable to botany or astronomy. So the levels are there and you will have a huge advantage if you take advantage of this data. Think of it this way. When you take your car out to drive on the road, there, there's signage which tells you how to drive safely. It tells you the speed limit, whether you can make a U-turn, where there's a stop sign or a light, no left turn, and so forth. If you don't obey the signage, hundreds of terrible things can happen to you. You can kill somebody. You can kill yourself. You can lose your license. You can have your insurance premium rate. All kinds of bad things happen to people who do not obey the signage. And that is what these 35 scales are like. Each of these scales is a roadmap for the corresponding area of life. So if you were to look at, let's say, the scale of thought, you would see there are seven levels of human thought. And it's extremely beneficial to know what level of thought you're using or what level of thought another person is using. Uh, this is very significant. This is not a subtle point. So, Jim, and in Jim, general, the scales are like. So, Jim, the scales, you're saying there's, 30, there's 35 scales, right? So do each scale have yes. seven levels? Yes. Okay. So that, that, that opens up a lot of understanding as well. You, because the 35 that you listed, yes. there's seven levels on there. So when we read the book, we would understand the levels and stages, correct? Well, I guess you could call them stages. I think level is, is, is a more appropriate word. Uh, there's just a level, you know, it's like if you take the scale of motivation, there are seven basic motivations. All the others are subsets of those. And they're in a hierarchy. There's the lowest and, you know, you work your way up to the highest. So that's true for all the scales. So uh, it, it, although every scale is unique, they all have this, these seven levels. And by the way, there is a section in the introduction called Y7, where I explain mathematically why it's seven. Okay. And you can go on my website and read that in the introduction, if you wish. So the seven le seven levels is what tells us what level we're at, right? Because each stage will be a different level. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by stage, but yes, everyone is at some As level. Scales. I mean scale. scales, not stages. <laughs> scales. Scales. Yes. So the 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 seven levels are on each scale. Right. Okay. There are seven, there are 35 scales, each of which has seven levels. Okay. And when, usually when people look at this, they get it right away. They look at the table and they say, oh, yeah, this makes sense. I, it's just that I figured out through this empirical experience that I had of helping hundreds of people and having them give me these levels right out of their mouths as we were working together, I figured this out and put it together. So on the scales, and I'm Jim, sure you. Yes. On, uh, we we have a question here. So on the scales, is each level different, or are they all the same for each scale? Well, it wouldn't make any sense to have seven levels if they were all the same. I mean, okay. Uh, each each level is different from every other level. But you have to also remember that each scale is different from every other scale. So you see, 
you have an axis, right? There are 35 axes. And you you're going up or down on the scale. When you're doing well, you're going up. When you're doing badly, you're going down. And you hit these stages, these levels, as you go up or down. And the power is, when you find your level, you know exactly what condition you're in, and you know what to do next because you can shoot for the next level up and you will be able to get there. Because I have given you the gradients. I'm telling you, uh, if you're improving, let's say physical fitness, that's one of, the, one of the scales, there are seven levels of physical fitness. And if you find your level and focus on getting up to the next one above that, you will improve. If you uh, don't know your level, you're just sort of wandering around. And that's how most people live. They just sort of wander around. Uh, they don't really have a, any, any scientific sense of, on this axis, I'm at this level. So this is a big step forward for anybody who uses it. So do you speak about this in colleges and seminars and webinars and all that, Jim? Well, what I've been doing so far is uh, I've done about over 130 uh, interviews okay. similar to this one in many different media. And many of the hosts have me back and actually put the scales up on the screen and have me elucidate the scale. So I'm, in, in a sense, teaching a course. I'm, ex ex in a sense, explaining the scale to the viewer. So I'm sort of explaining all of this online, which is kind of how things are going now. You know, we're moving away from the old system of going into classrooms, uh, going to the universities, and moving more now toward everything being online because they don't have to go anywhere. So that's how I'm teaching it. Well, thank you so much for that, Jim. Uh, and, and does this have to do with any of the per basic personalities of an individual as a human being? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by have anything to do with. Because there's the four uh, basic personalities, right? Yeah, well, that's a different system. Okay. This is... This is okay. A unique, new, revolutionary system. This data did not exist before I discovered it. And nobody had it really until I released it. So that's why I'm spending my time getting this out to people. Because it helps you to improve yourself and your life. Let me give you an example, hypothetically, so, 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 so you can see how you can apply this. Let's say you have a girlfriend who's having relationship problems, right? Very common situation. Yep. You say, come here, Gertrude, let me show you this. And you say, take a look at this scale of relationships. Now, just the fact that there is a scale of relationships is going to be a new idea to her. She's just going to say, you mean there's a scale of relationships? And they're in a certain order. And you can have her say, yeah, this relationship that you're struggling with, where is it on this scale? Now, what will probably happen is, in a matter of seconds, she'll find a bracket. She'll say, well, it's either at three or four or five. See, she's already thrown out four levels. Then you say to her, okay, read the chapter. So she reads the chapter, come back and say, okay, now, which is it, three, four, five? And she'll probably be able to say, yeah, I can see now it's, it's level four. That's where we are. It's defined. So that gives her clarity on what this relationship is. What's going on? Now, it also tells her she can improve it by moving it to level three. And that is something that, assuming she has some cooperation from the other person, they will be able to do because it's the next level up. So it tells you how to improve it. Then you can say to her, let's look at the scale of sexuality. Now, I already know if two people are not compatible on the scale, they cannot have a successful romantic relationship. They could be the smartest, nicest people in the world. Sometimes you don't hear, hear about people who they get along well, they like one another, they're very nice people, they're smart, 
but they can't have a romantic relationship. It doesn't work for them. Okay, they can have a non-romantic, and that's because they are conflicting on the scale. So you can say, where are you on this scale? Where is your boyfriend on this scale, you see? And by finding that out, she might say, well, right there, I can see this relationship is not going anywhere. We're at conflicting levels. I'm at this level, and it's not compatible with this guy's level. So this isn't going to work. So you just did a big favor for that person by telling them not to waste more time on a relationship that's going nowhere. And it tells you right there. Or the opposite might happen. She said, well, you know, we are compatible on this scale. Okay, so you have something to work on. Then you could say, take a look at the scale of allegiance. Now, any time relationships deteriorate, it's always because allegiance has deteriorated. So you can find your level on that scale, and then you can move yourself up, and you can find the other person's level. See, these will be two different things. I mean, one out of seven times, the two people will be at the same level, but six out of seven times, they're not going to be at the same level. So each person can use it to move up the scale, and that will improve the relationship. Or you can say, look at the scale of permeation. Permeation is the basic action of a spiritual being. When two people love one another, it's because they're permeating one another. So you can say, take a look at this. Where are you on this scale? This is an individual scale. And you can say, well, I can see here, you know, after studying it, I'm at level, let's say, four. You know, And where's the other person? Well, maybe the other person is at a lower level. Maybe the other person is at level six. And you see, that's part of the explanation of why they're having this relationship problem. And... If you're going to continue with the relationship, you both should be moving up, up, and that makes it better. You know, if you're at four, you move to three. If she's at six, she moves to five. And at that point, you will have a better relationship because you'll be permeating one another better. When you can't stand somebody, you don't want to permeate him. You want him far away, right? That's, so where there is hatred, there's no permeation. And when there is love, there's tremendous permeation. And again, you can look at the seven levels and you'll see that they make sense because they're naturally occurring. Well, you said earlier in the show, Jim, that so that's nobody, you said earlier in the show, Jim, that no one will ever have a level one or two, correct? I don't think I said that, no. Oh, okay. So I must, I must I, have you, misunderstood. You, 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 Yes. So I misunderstood. So the, the level two and one, is that the strongest level out there? Well, again, every scale is unique. Generally speaking, level one is the highest level on the scale. That's why it's called level one. Uh, now, I can tell you for sure, very few people, maybe less than 1%, are at or near the top of all the scales. A larger number, maybe 2%, are at or near the bottom of all the scales. Most of us are high on some scales and low on others. And that's why different people use different scales to correct their lives. So, for example, a very famous example of this that we all know is Bill Clinton. In his field of endeavor as a politician, he is a very smart person. He was a Rhodes Scholar. If you listen to him speak or read his writings, he's a very smart man. He knows politics. If I wanted to discuss politics, I would love to discuss it with him because he knows what it's about. Okay? So on the scale of human ability, he's at a very high level. However, equally notorious is the fact that he's a serial abuser of women. Now, I'm not telling any tales out of school here. Everybody knows this, right? I mean, he was sued by many women because of the way he treated them. And this, women have come out and gone on video and explained in detail how he raped them. So this is no big secret that I'm telling anybody. So what you can infer from that is on the scale of sexuality, he's at a low level. As so opposed he's like to the a scale seven. of ability, he's at a low level. So he's at no, a, like a well, seven. seven would be 
seven would be the lowest level. I'm not saying what level he's at. Oh, I'm okay. just saying he's, he's at a lower level on that scale. And this is what you normally find. Like you'll find a guy, you know, he's a whiz on Wall Street. He lives in a $5 million condominium. He drives a, a, a Mercedes, you know, but he doesn't, he can't get along with women. He can't get a date. Women don't like him. Okay, so he would want to look at, as I said before, he might look at the scale of relationships. He might look at the scale of permeation. He might look at the scale of sexuality. And somewhere along there, he's going to have some big realizations as to what's going on with him. He'll find out his level. Now, I'm not saying he should tell anyone. I advise everyone, never tell anyone someone's level on any scale if the person is alive. Notice oh. I did not give levels for Bill Clinton. I just gave a general example that mm -hmm. everybody knows that he's very good at one thing and not so good at another thing. And of course, everybody knows who he is. So uh, now the reason you never tell anybody is, first of all, it's counterproductive. If you want to help somebody, show him the scale. It's not that hard to figure out, all right? You have him read the glossary, you have him study the scale, and you say to him, find your level on this scale, okay? And as I said, he'll probably find a bracket very quickly, and then you say, okay, read the chapter, and then try to find your level. And when he finds his level, he will be happy with it. Doesn't matter what level he finds, he will be happy with it because it's the truth. So I'll give you an example how to use this. Let's say you have a guy, he's dating a woman, he's thinking of marrying her. Now, it would be very smart for him to know her motivation. Why is she interested in marrying this guy? Now, if the answer is she wants to marry him because she loves him, that's level one on the scale of motivation. That's the highest motivation. So that's a good reason to marry her. But if she wants to marry him because he drives a Maserati, he owns a yacht, and he flies his own Learjet. That's a different reason. Now, there are people who are content with that. You know, there are a lot of older, rich guys who are not too attractive, who are perfectly happy to marry a young, beautiful woman who's a gold digger. They don't care. Uh, now, so, you know, it's not saying what choice you should make. But for this hypothetical guy that I posited, the difference between knowing she loves him and knowing she's a gold digger could be the difference between marrying her and ending the relationship. Either way, he's better off because it's the truth. So what, uh, when should we give these levels? And, and uh, I'm looking for the, the scales. Like what age should we per, be presenting this to our children? Well, first of all, the person has to be able to read English reasonably well. Okay. Now that varies from child to child. You know, there are millions and millions of kids, uh, people in the United States who can barely read, and not even kids, adults who can barely read. They can't read this book. You have to be able to read reasonably well. Uh, and the fact that somebody has a graduate degree does not mean the, per mean the person can read well. And I can give you anecdotes to, to substantiate that. <clears throat> there are many people in STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, who are not very literate. You see, most people think of literacy as, well, either you're literate or you're illiterate. No, that's binary. There are actually seven levels of literacy. And it makes a big difference. You see, if I were going to hire a guy to take care of my garden, it wouldn't particularly matter to me how literate he is. He has to know how to take care of a lawn and flower beds and such. But if I'm going to hire somebody to ghost write a book for me, I want somebody who's literate. And you can use the scale to spot it. Again, it's not that hard to use. So uh, that's you know one way of using one particular scale. Well, and, and people are at different levels as well, right? Because somebody who could be 12 years old have the, the mind of a genius and, and can really read well. So that's, right. that's why I'm asking that's right. what age what what age level would be able to, 
to understand the levels and the and the and the scales. Depends on depends on the kid. Okay. You know, that's 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 my answer. I mean, there are there are I would say most 13 year olds who are, you know, either in high school or about to go into high school, <coughs> if they're good students, they can read reasonably well. They could probably read the book. But uh, even if another person, even if the person can't read, you can still help them with it because you can understand the person. See, uh, let's say you have a kid who's seven. He's having a lot of trouble in school. Well, if you look at the scale of scholarship, I tell you there are seven levels of scholarship, and I tell you with specificity how to make someone a better scholar, no matter what level he's at. So you can study that, and you can observe that this kid is, let's say, at level five. And then you can use the information in the book to assist him and move him up to level four, even though he doesn't know anything about the book. You see? So you can use this to help people. Now again, you're not telling him his level. But at some point in industrialized society, he's gonna learn how to read, and then you can say, read this. Well, thank you so much for that, Jim. <laughs> So we're getting up to almost the hour here. So before we get to the end of the show, I want to find out what your tea is tonight. If you were to serve a tea to my audience, what words would you give me? Actually, you know, the ones that you use, teaching, education, awareness, that's pretty good. <coughs> I, I would be happy to go with that. Well, thank you so much. <coughs> Before we wrap up, I asked all my guests this question. What your favorite color is? And you gave me the color black. Why black, Jim? Yeah. <coughs> well, I'll tell you. First of all, on a quotidian level, black goes with everything. If you give me a red tie or a green tie or a yellow tie, I can wear it with black. That's one thing. Another thing is black is the area of mystery. You know, when an area is black, it's unknown. And I'm very interested in areas of enigma, mystery, unknown areas. And I spent most of my life plumbing those depths, which is why I've figured out what the subject is, kind of by accident. Because I was looking at the areas that most people don't look into. So, you know, the unknown, black sort of symbolizes the unknown. And that's kind of a province of mine. I, you, when I find an area of unknown, I study it, or I meditate on it, or both, and then I come to understand it, and then it's no longer black to me, and I go on to another area of blackness. And and that that's really interesting that you say mystery because black is a mystery color, right? It's a solid color, so it's a really color that's really firm. Like the pattern is solid, correct? Yeah. Well, black. I mean, from a physics point of view, black means no light. <coughs> a black object reflects no light. That's why it looks black. <coughs> I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm coughing now. Oh, that's okay. Uh, and I ask you one word to describe yourself as an individual, and you gave me the word ethics. Why ethics for? Yes. Ethics supersedes everything for human beings. Actually, uh, this is not septemics, but the structure of society makes ethics the most important work. I'll tell you what I mean. The top level is the area of administration and management. That's the area of money. <coughs> That's where you find real estate brokers, stock brokers, bankers, and so forth. <coughs> that sits on top of the productive level. Miners, farmers, fishermen, people who have a product, people who make shoes, okay? They have a product. That is what the people at level four are managing. 
if there were no producers, there would be nothing to manage. But below that is the level of ethics. Because if, a, let's say, you hire an engineer to work on uh, a startup, if the guy fails to show up because he ha has a hangover or because he uh, is on drugs, it doesn't matter how good an engineer he is. He's not there. Yeah. So this is a lot of what's wrong with society. Ethics is missing. You have to have ethics in order to succeed at anything. Ethics basically means doing what you believe is right. That's in a, in a rudimentary way, that's what ethics is. Now below that, you have people who lack ethics. Those people we call criminals. And that's why we have police and military. So that all of society is in those four strata. And the operative one is ethics, because if you don't solve ethics, you don't have anything. Well, I want to really thank so like you. So, say we have a guy. Okay, I was just going to give an example. Say no, you have no, a guy go, who's go he's. Uh, go say you have a guy who's very smart, right? He's going to school. He's getting straight A's, but he holds up a gas station, right? That's stupid. All right. That is a lack of ethics. That is not an ethical thing to do. And so instead of graduating college, he goes to jail. So really ethics, you know, that's, that's what I've focused on all the time. Am I doing the ethical thing? Um, like for example, I'm on a very strict diet and I spoke to a, uh, a medical assistant once. She said, do you ever cheat? I said, no. She said, well, how do you do that? I said, well, I just figure out what I should be eating and that's what I eat. I don't need anything else because I already figured out what I should eat. So if I were to, for example, eat sugar, that's not ethical. I know it's bad for me. And so therefore, if I were to do it, it would be unethical. Therefore, I don't do it. So there are people who are, they, they're weak in the area of ethics, like a guy who cheats on his wife or a wife who cheats on the husband. That's unethical. Now, if you want to go to the wife and say, look, I want a divorce, I want to go out with somebody else, okay, do that. That could be ethical, but not to sneak around behind the person's back, that's unethical. And that's what mostly our problems are about. And, and, that, and that truly is the issue, is we sneak, we're sneaky. So we're not, eth we're not ethical, we're, we're being non-ethic. Well, yeah, I mean, if a person is ethical, he's usually very open. Yep. Very transparent. You see, it doesn't have anything to hide. Yeah. You know, like if the police come and say they want to search my house, I say, fine, have a good time. I would hope they don't plant something because they're trying to get at me. But I mean, that's kind of a paranoid thought, so I wouldn't necessarily think that way. But I don't care if they look in my closets. What are they going to find? They're going to find clothes and shoes, you know? Yeah. So now somebody who's dealing drugs or dealing arms or something like that, he's not going to want police sneaking around his house because he's doing unethical things. Yeah. So, Jim, if anybody would like to get your book, where could they find your book? <clears throat> well, I invite your listeners to go to my website, which is septemics.com, S-E-P-T-E-M-I-C-S.com where you can find how to get the book. But before you do that, you can read what many uh, readers of the book have said. You can read what journalists have written. You can read the reviews. You can read sections of the book itself. And you can even hear me giving a 15 minute pre-recorded explanation of what the subject is, which will explain it to you in 15 minutes. So then if you want to get it, it's available in hardbound, softbound, and ebook. And it's available wherever books are sold. Of course, you can get it on Amazon and Barnes and Nobles, or you can get it from the publisher. But really, if you just type the word Septemix in a search engine, you'll get hundreds of responses, including all the people who are selling the book. You know, Joe's Bookstore in Seattle. Well, we'll thank you it. so much, we'll Jim. Up. 
Well, I want to really thank you for being a guest tonight on Tea Time and sharing your tea and teaching us a little bit about ethics and colors and this and this and the scales and the levels. And for anybody that would like to know more about Jim Marshalls, please check out his website at septemics.com. Am I saying it right, Septemic? Septemics. Septemics. Uh, check out his website and you can find out more information there. Uh, I want to thank all the listeners and viewers who tuned in tonight, the people who sent in some questions and all of that good stuff. And I will see everybody next Thursday, same time, same place for three new shows. Uh, we'll be starting at 10 a.m., 3 p.m., and 7 p.m. And tonight, in about an hour, I'll be releasing all of the guests that will be coming on Tea Time in April. So stay tuned for that. Again, thank you, Jim. Uh, don't leave. I'm just going to wrap up and close up the live, and then we're going to have ourselves a good evening. So again, thank you to everyone who has tuned into Tea Time tonight and making a difference one cup of tea at a time.